Bible so boring? But, um, and some people aren't very blind to that. Um, <laughs> I think I titled it, Will It Make You Fall Asleep? Oh, are they ever? Is it on? <laughs> oh. the, f the funny thing is, I was just, while doing this, while doing this class, um, just in the past week, I started noticing that whether we think the Bible's interesting or not, that uh, cartoonists think it's great material for them. Um, here's one from the New Yorker on the tree of, not, not the tree of knowledge, but the tree of information. Um, <laughs> Offers everything you want to know about apples. Um, this, one, this one I saw several times. A virgin birth, I can believe, but I a three one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so does, anybody, does anyone want to be a Bible nerd this Christmas season? Um, this is this is how you do it. Uh, first of all, how many wise men were there in the Bible? We don't know. Okay, that's right. It, and what does it say? We brought three gifts. And that's how you do it. And where did they meet Jesus? Stable. No stable. Stable's in Luke. This is in Matthew. There's no reference to it. They met him at his house. They met him at his house. Um, yeah, I think I think it's, um, if you have a Bible, we should have a Bible, should we? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I always love that one, your church. And I, I think it's uh, Matthew 2, it's like 10, 11, something like that. It is Matthew 2. <laughs> yeah, it's Matthew 2, 10. Um, okay, here it is. When they saw the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child in Mary. <clears throat> so... Go to people's nativity scenes and set up houses somewhere. <laughs> or, or just pull out all of the wise men and see if they notice. Um, House has multiple meanings. It, it does, but I, I don't think it means stable. Um, so it, it could mean anything, but it actually says that, uh, that um, in chapter 1 um, that uh, Joseph brought Mary to yeah. his house. So... Um, uh, I'm assuming it means some sort of place where they live. Probably those mm -hmm. those four room houses that are all over the place in Israel, which is a good thing for this class. That um, going to Israel is is a really good thing to help you. As who's been to Israel? Raise your hand. Yeah, um, for helping you understand. And here's one more. This one's a little body. It's, it's, at, at first, I was teaching Job a lesson, but now I'm just messing with him. <laughs> As you can see, it's a flaming bag of something. I don't know. Why. <laughs> so, um, and you like the like fist, fist bumps? <laughs> the fist bumps are great. <laughs> so, um, before we get on to this, I wanted to just touch on, there's been a ton of religion in the news, and um, maybe for just a couple minutes, if you have something you want to say, um, obviously, in the past week, we've had two weeks. We've had situation in Paris, situation in San Bernardino, and situation with the Planned Parenthood, um, and a lot of discussion about what we should do. And, and um, I, I, I've had a couple of thoughts uh, about this. And if anybody wants to jump in and, and talk about how you're, I'm interested in how you're processing this stuff because in each of these cases, religion plays a part, um, and in some cases, a major part. Um, and I've listened to, I listened, uh, I listened Friday to a, a two hour diatribe about Islam and how it's a corrupt religion and so forth, um, and, and on a national radio show. And so I was just thinking, what, what do we, how are we processing these things? Go ahead. What struck me more than even the Islam piece was after um, the shooting in San Bernardino is the headline, prayer isn't fixing this, or whatever, is that next hey, slide? Hey, you're stealing my material. God isn't fixing this. <laughs> and after that, I read quite a few articles, um, particularly about like, um, some of the CLCA <coughs> writers about um, the misunderstanding that, you like, I mean, prayer without action is a solution to things, or most things. Right. And it seems like the per I mean, I don't know anything about the person who came up with that headline or approved it or whatever. Oh, yeah. And it's yeah. obviously yeah, very, very eye controversial. Very controversial. A lot of journalists had a discussion about this and whether it's appropriate. I mean, is it more of an editorial than a, than okay. anything else? But right. obviously, it's a statement about gun control. And I, I don't know if you guys saw it, but New York Times for the first time 
in 70 years had a front page editorial on gun control as well. Um, yeah. So. Um, I just thought that piece was really interesting to me that out of this, that was like the most, um, I would say, you know, got the most buzz. Well, there seems like to be a division in those discussions by the pe by people saying that 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 what God's activity is is separate from what we do. And it reminds me of that old joke about the guy who's in a flood and on top of his house and somebody comes yeah. with a boat and then, <laughs> and then, you know, again and again. And and then when he dies, he goes to heaven and God was like, I sent you how yeah. many boats or whatever right. to try to save you. Right. And you didn't notice that, you know, it's actually an idea and not to get too philosophical, but it's an understanding of God as this transcendental figure that's way up there and does his thing and is completely separate from what goes on down here, <laughs> instead of a God that's imminent, immanent, uh, who's right here with us. Um, it's, it's, you know, the play in the two stories, and I'll discuss this in a little bit, in Genesis, where you have Genesis 1 and the first part of chapter 2, and then chapter 2 through, through 3, you have one where God is up there, far away, he's this omnipotent God, he creates everything, and then starting in, in chapter 2, verse 2, he, uh, verse 4, I'm sorry, verse 4, he becomes someone who's walking in the garden with him. And those were two completely different stories, and an editor who put together Genesis puts those together and comes up with a new meaning of a God who's both, not either or. Um, so, but it's it's interesting that that discussion made me think about those things when I saw it. And that just struck me even more than the conversations about Islam, and, um, you know, I am interested in the Islam like part. Yeah. I, th there is the, the things that, that interest me in the Islam part. One, one, I mean, two things that strike me, and it's not just Islam. The Planned Parenthood shooting was by a guy who's a, a relative, I mean, a, I mean, he, I, I've read several profiles of him. He's a little yeah. bit of a bizarre guy, but That's conservative true. theologically, not, ed not trained, but sort of wild and loose in his own personal life or whatever. But there, there's one thing that was common, I think, with, or maybe two things that are common with these things. One is the certainty with which each of the people carrying these things out are that their faith is the right one, and those who don't agree with them, that's, that's a major problem. Um, and and um, the other one is that most of these people have no formal training in religion at all. I read one story that said 25% a little more than 25% of the Muslims from France who go and join ISIS um, have uh, spent a significant time in prison and received and were converts um, in the prison system, and that's where they're getting a lot of their a lot of their education. But um, one one theme that's very interesting to me in this, and I, I don't see it a lot. Maybe you guys have seen it, and that's about ISIS and its apocalyptic side. Yeah. Are you guys familiar with that? And their magazine called uh, Dabi is the town where they, their Armageddon, their Megiddo, where they believe everything will come together. And so it's an interesting discussion when you start talking about ground troops because they believe that the final battle will be a literal battle by the forces of the secular forces against theirs led by the Messiah. And it'll be in Dabi and the winner will be the, the um, ISIS caliphate, um, and, and so it's it's funny how that how that how do you respond to that sort of thinking? Um, it would be the, the closest I could find I could think of in a Christian parallel. Maybe you guys could think of another one. Would be like fighting a large group of Branch Davidians. Yeah. <clears throat> how, how would you deal with that? And the problem was the FBI didn't know how to communicate with those guys, and it created tons of problems, and eventually led to the destruction. And in much of the discussions I've been hearing, there's not much talk about, you know, understanding the theology that's that's behind this. Well, we're able to separate. Right? And, and you know, the weird thing is, Christian. this whole story about the Dabiq is not is not in the Quran. It's in the Hadith. Does, do you guys know what the Hadith is? <laughs> it, it's sort of like the Talmud. It's extra stuff that that Muhammad said. It'd be also like in our our thing, like table talks, where Luther said stuff and students wrote down. It was other stuff that people wrote down that, that Muhammad said or went on at that time. And one of the other other uh, forces of the Hadith has the Messiah in Dabiq who ends up winning as Jesus, um, which is really weird because many people don't realize that there is this strand within Islam in which Jesus is the one who returns um, and, and cleans up and fixes up everything. And that's because he's esteemed as this 
important profit and so forth. So, any other thoughts on this? Go ahead. So, so for me, the 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 San Bernardino shooting was more frightening because because no one, even the family members of these people, predicted that they were like this. So. Well, it took ISIS two days to figure out that they were responsible. <laughs> right. It took ISIS two days. Because it's inspiration and it's uh, well, quiet yeah. inspiration. And it's, a, it's, a, it's different than, and, and you know, similarly to the Planned Parenthood uh, uh, shooting, it's an inspiration right. from... Right, and, from and, you know, how big is, how big is ISIS? Right. They may have, know the numbers, how many, so, so uh, Muslims, you've got more than a billion Muslims worldwide. How many members are there of ISIS? A few, a few thousand. A few thousand? It, ISIS is smaller than Tosa. Okay? It's about 35,000 people. <clears throat> so when you start, it, it's hard to extrapolate one way back and forth. Obviously, this is, there is something within Islam where people are taking that and radical it, Muslims are using it to attack other people. But you got to keep things in context in terms of uh, the, num the number of people. Back to apocalypse. The apocalypse. If if we could get them to set a date. Oh, that would help things. I'm not sure that would help things. If they said it sometime really soon, I would like it if it was like the year 3000. Do it now, and it's not going to happen. And then takes a window. Yeah, if they would set it like a month ago, fast behind us, that would be good. Do you think that the fact that <coughs> Islam does not have a hierarchy like traditional Christianity does has is a factor in this? And I've, I've listened to just what you said talking about the apocalypse thing and lectures on it, and that uh, some of the experts, quote unquote, think the only way it will be countered is from within mainstream Islam, whatever that is. And the fact that it doesn't have this strict hierarchy is a factor in this whole thing. I think a bigger issue is not the strict hierarchy because as Protestants, we don't have a really strict. I mean, when I'm thinking about an issue, I don't say, mm, what did the bishop say? And I think first I'd have to figure out who the bishop was um, because that's just not the way we think about things. Um, so that's, that's not um, such a big issue. I think a bigger issue that is that um, that Islam has a, didn't go through a reformation. Um, and um, I, I think that's a concern. And the integration of secular thinking, the, the very bizarre thing is the lifestyle of a number of the people who are terrorists is very Western in terms of like, um, you know, the one, of the, the one of the individuals in Paris had spent the last couple nights before the bombings there uh, going to, hanging out and at dance parties and that sort of stuff. It's, it's just sort of a, sort of a weird mix. Um, but again, I think about that in terms of lack of formal training and so forth. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, okay. I was just gonna say that Time Magazine a couple of issues ago had a very comprehensive coverage of ISIS, uh, a series of different articles. Okay, yeah. um, there, there are a lot of good places. I mean, The Guardian uh, in England has done a lot of good stuff. New York Times does stuff almost every day on ISIS and developments there. Um, th there are things, and actually we're supposed to teach a class on other religions in the, in the spring, and um, we haven't really talked about what we're gonna do, but this is something that obviously is out there. And I thought, this is going on in the news right now, maybe it's something we should, we should focus on. Um, so now we're going to the a more boring topic. Is the Bible. Um, um, so just to help me out a little bit, um, and you don't have to feel embarrassed about this, and I'll tell you what I what I do. But has anyone here read the entire Bible? Ra raise your hand. You've read the entire Bible. Okay, you're better than I am. I've not, I've not read the entire Bible. I had to for I've, confirmation. I've, what's that? I had to for confirmation years Did ago. Did you? Wow. <clears throat> you know, the amazing thing is, if you if you've read it, to understand it takes a massive amount of work. Um, to to do it for confirmation. That, that's did you were you did you do something wrong? No, I was a pastor's kid. Because I haven't done it. It was it was it has anyone here well, I assume some of you has anyone read the entire New Testament? So those who raised your hands, yes. 
Anybody else who's read the entire New Testament? What about the entire Old Testament? And how did you make it through Leviticus, okay? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty tedious stuff. Um, Deuteronomy is a little yeah. more interesting. Joshua Judges, I can't do this. What's that? All the kings. It just it's a, it's a history book, and that's well the, the the Deuteronomic history. There is a section that's a history, but it's actually not like our history. But it is a it's historical. It's not literally the science of history. Um, and um, has anyone tried to read the Bible starting in Genesis and to read it all the way through? I, tell me how far you got. Genesis twelve. Genesis twelve. Okay. I've done it twice. Made it all the way through. Yeah, I had I had this goal because I've never really read the Bible until I started doing much more Bible studies here at St. Right. Matthews and that type of thing. And um, it is, I still, that's why I'm here, because I still have ungushly difficult time with so I, I, much I, of the Bible well, that I sure. can't even believe it. I mean, it took the first time I did it within a year, and the next time I did it within about two years. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, First, I mean, just reading the Bible, I mean, it's 66 books, all different types of literature, completely different stuff, and you have to know the history, it's helpful to know the language, all of those things, it's incredibly, it's amazing. You know, last year for confirmation, I did this presentation where I talk about six rules for understanding the Bible, and I've taught it here with the adults too, and used verses that are a little more body, but not the worst verses in the Bible. Um, and, and, but um, I told, two kids said, we want to know where to read. And I usually tell them, start with the Gospel of Mark. It's, it's short, it's readable, and your, your picture of who Jesus is is going to be different after you read that than what it was before. It's a different picture of who Jesus is. If you just read Mark in isolation, and they said, well, what else? I said, Genesis. Genesis has some great stories in it. Mm -hmm. And then I went and read Mark, and that was great. And I was like, yeah, this is cool. I'm glad I recommend that. And then I read <laughs> Genesis, and I was like, that was so stupid. Because <laughs> the writing is weird, because it, there's so much duplication. And if no one explains to you why there's so much duplication, it makes it awkward reading. But we'll talk to, on all that stuff, and we're right now on slide eight of 31, so we need to get moving. <laughs> but um, this, is, this is sort of my way I think about reading the Bible, and we're gonna focus on, focus on the first step. It's receive, reflect, and react. So the receive part's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about getting it. And, and I think of reading the Bible as a conversation, because it is, it was, it was all, presented orally at first. It wasn't written, most of the stuff was not written at first, it was told, and people would talk about it and have conversations. The only thing is a written document, we have one person talking, one person listening. Um, actually, more than one person talking, frequently many people talking. Um, and, and you know, just to think about the Bible originally, it was, um, you know, as it was also public, not just oral. And so this idea that we're supposed to do private devotions that's not something that you would have much of a concept of when the Bible was being written. First of all, it'd be so awkward since everything was on scrolls. Um, <laughs> if you're looking up, oh, what does First Samuel say about this? Go get that too. But um, um, so, so I try to think of it as a, com a conversation. And as a, for a good conversation to work, um, what, what do you need? Um, you, you need to be listening. And that's our role when we first start dealing with the text. We need to be, we need to learn to be good listeners. Um, just for the record, I'm a terrible listener. Um, I'm an incredibly bad listener. I've been told this forever because when people start talking, I want to start telling them what they said is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Most conversations are excuses for me to correct them. So, um, and, and that's true. Not all conversations are good ones. This is more like me. I'm trying to be a good listener, but you keep breaking my <laughs> Not all conversations are good conversations, but this is my first rule. Today we're going to go through five rules. Two of these rules are new. I'm excited about them. I love these rules. They're not mine because, as I've told you before, this is one place where I can plagiarize at will and not get into trouble. Um, so the first part is the opening of the Bible is the start of a conversation. And so th th this is a mindset. It's not anything in terms of how you do it, and it's different than seeing it as a rule book or as a constitution or, um, or as something that's gonna tell me, you know, I, I grew up in a fundamentalist background, as many of you know, and 
we would go to the Bible to, to, for almost everything that we did. I had in roommates at the evangelical school I went to who thought that making decisions about what they wore in the morning and their clothing choices was something that you could choose. I had my uh, now late father-in-law, um, before he would take trips, would take his Bible, hold it open, let it fall open, and then find a verse that he thought was relevant to the thing. So, um, so the Bible was something that, that it was treated as you know something that was telling us what to do it wasn't a conversation of back and forth and next week we're going to talk about the back and the fourth part today we're going to talk about the, the first part so as i said all conversations are not good conversations and if even if you're listening well you might not be able to understand or hear where people are coming from um and i i'm not going to show a video because we have problems with videos but i'll tell you the story about the importance of understanding the context of the person talking to you. You won't understand what they're saying if you don't understand the context of what they're telling you. I have uh, my best friend from college, this huge Formula One racing fan, and a couple of years ago he bought me tickets, $150 to sit, great seats for the race. I know nothing about Formula One racing, nothing at all. I didn't even know what sort of cars they drove. And so I went and for two hours I watched cars go around the track and I read the manual, and, and people around me were so excited. Lots of people with flags, flags waving, people singing chants, national anthems. It was a great, great environment. I loved it. Has anyone here been to a Formula One race? Mm -hmm. It's a great environment. It's probably a little bit like going to um, a World Cup soccer match. But I was completely confused and didn't understand anything about what was going on. And I decided, um, my friend bought me tickets because he thought I liked it the first time. He bought me tickets one more time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I decided to use this to try to understand why this created meaning for them and it didn't for me. And the thing is, um, what, what I started thinking about was stuff from my graduate school days and, and sociology about how you establish meaning. And part of it is vertical. These people had a historical understanding of who these people were and how they related to each other. And there was a, a horizontal understanding too. They knew how these racers connected with each other, who was in first place, who was in second, who was having a good year, who was injured, who was from Brazil, who was from France. I didn't know any of that stuff. But because of their vertical and their horizontal understanding of these things, they were able to get some sort of meaning and significance out of it. And if you want to understand how this works, I just have to show you a picture of Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. <laughs> and as soon as you do that, you realize that almost all of us here have this horizontal understanding and we have this vertical understanding. It's so horizontal understanding, we know the team's record right now is what? 84. Okay, good job. Yeah. Um, and, and, and how far was the pass on, on Thursday night? 64 <laughs> yards. So we have both. <laughs> Both, we have both a horizontal understanding, we know they're eight and four, and we have this vertical understanding of what happened within the game, connecting the people together. So, right. I didn't even have to ask the question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so people started to say 61. <laughs> so, so context is the, is the thing. And that's my second rule. And these are both very, very simple, you think, but I'll, I'm going to give you my point three and four, the ones I really like, to help you out. And that is context is key. Try to understand where the author is coming from. And yes, I ended in a preposition, but I don't buy Latin eight grammar. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so we can we can deal with that. But let's now talk about how do you create context. And this is one of the rare times where I can connect what I do for a living with, with what I do here at work. How, how do you create context? How do you get that, his, how do you get that vertical and that horse, horizontal understanding? Well, there's an easy way. They drop, when there's an incident, like the San Bernardino incident, d reporters are dropped in, have no understanding of what's happening, and what are they told to do? They're told to ask these questions. What, when, where, why, and how? Um, and, and those are the sorts of questions that we should have in mind when, when we're dealing with the Bible, um, when, when we're um, trying to understand what's going on. And I'm going to take a couple of these, these questions and explore um, not 
particular books, but the entire New Testament, entire Old Testament. And some of you are going to say, I always tell you to break it down 66 books, they're very different, and all that sort of stuff. But for this, I'm going to talk about the New Testament, or I prefer Hebrew Bible, just because old makes it sound like it's antiquated or whatever, but you can't understand who Jesus is if you don't understand the book of Leviticus, which is weird, but it's true. Um, you can't understand what the kingdom of God is, um, which is the central message in the New Testament about understanding of Leviticus as well. Um, and then I'm going to take the New Testament, and, and we're going to look at, um, at, at uh, where. The where question is where we're going first, which is probably the last question you'd be interested in in understanding the Old Testament. But actually, um, who, who here was on the Germany trip? Anybody here? Yeah. Okay. Um, when we were in one of the museums, the guy did a, this presentation that I'm getting ready to give to you in about uh, half an hour, and I'm trying to do it in like three or four. Um, but it, it's very helpful in understanding the, the Old Testament. Um. <clears throat> Simple map. This is a map of the ancient Near East. And as you can see, here's Israel, here's Judah, here's Egypt, and then here's the um, here's um, Assyria, Babylon, Persia. Okay? The important thing for understanding almost everything in the Old Testament is that there are, throughout this time, two superpowers. There's Egypt, which is a superpower, and then this region. And this changes from time to time. Sometimes it's Assyria, sometimes it's Babylon, sometimes it's Persia, sometimes it's the Medes, and eventually in 333, Greece comes around and takes over all this stuff. Okay, so you have this here and this here. And Israel's in between. In between. It's called, in geographic terms, a land bridge. Because you have the desert over here, and if these people want to attack these people, they've got to go through Israel. If these people want to attack these people, they've got to go through Israel. Okay? So throughout the time in the Old Testament, <clears throat> you have two war, two fronts, two superpowers with Israel stuck in between. As a result, a lot of bad things happened to Israel during that time. Okay? When you start thinking about what's going on, if you start with Abraham, Abraham starts up here and he moves down to Israel. Then he ends up in Egypt for a while and then comes back to Canaan as it's known. And there's one period in the Old Testament where both of these superpowers are on the wing. They're both, they're both not very powerful. Does anyone know when that was? It would have been about 1000 BC or BCE, whichever you prefer, which was when David becomes king. And it's the time that all Jews today think of as the glorious period in history. But it was helped out by the fact that the Egyptians were squabbling with themselves and the Babylonians were over here not doing so well. But as soon as they come to power, they both have they, the Babylonians decide to come through here um, and, and to attack. Um, and I want you to think about some of the issues that, that come up when you read the, the Old Testament and how this is affected. Um, one, the idea of Job, the whole book. The book is essentially about a guy who's done nothing wrong, who gets, um, who gets um, grilled, mistreated, loses everything or whatever. This is the story of Israel. Israel didn't pick to be there, but it is there. And again and again, it gets whacked from both sides. <clears throat> it's, a try, it's, a, it's a community trying to understand why does this keep on happening to us? There is no real explanation. Uh, another, issue, another one um, that's, that's interesting, um, is the book of Jonah. Okay, the book of Jonah has him going where? Nineveh. Has him going up here to Nineveh, up to one of the superpowers who have mistreated them forever. No wonder he didn't want to go there. He didn't want to convert people who are their enemies. You know, it's like going, and we talked about ISIS, like going to the people in ISIS and saying, God's going to give you a break. Everybody here is going to be fine and dandy if you convert to uh, Jesus Christ today. It was, not, it was not something that they wanted to do. It's, it's going in and, and, and going in literally to where your enemies were. One other concept that I'm thinking about, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure where I am on it, but... You know, their understanding of who God is, I think, was affected by this. Because in ancient times, you start off with polytheism. Everybody has their own God. And then you move to a thing called henotheism, H-E-N-O, theism. And that is, everybody has their own God, 
but my God's the best one, and he can <laughs> kick your God's butt, and uh, he can do it again and again. And powerful civilizations were henotheistic civilizations. Egypt was a henotheistic civilization, and so, so were most of the Babylonians. They thought their God was better than everybody else, and they proved it by defeating them. Well, Israel couldn't really have a henotheistic religion because their God kept on, their side kept on losing. It doesn't say very much about their God, and eventually they come up with the notion that there's one God that oversees everybody. And you can see um, in a book like Deuteronomy 32, you can see where this idea is shifting from a henotheistic understanding of things uh, in Israel to a to a monotheistic um, thing. Another thing that I think is interesting and it, it's why is the issue of justice so important to a country like this okay for most of these other countries power is the issue you want to win but when you're being trampled on all the time the issue becomes justice okay and there are two different types of justice a guy named john diamond crossing has talked about this a great deal there are two different types and two competing ideas of justice in the old testament and one is um what he calls um uh, retributive justice, which is how th what should happen to the people who keep on tr mistreating us, and that is they should end up going to hell, destroyed or whatever. And these notions of, of getting back at them uh, are very strong in portions of the Old and New Testament, including Revelation. And then the other the other idea is distributive justice. Maybe we should all be a equal, get along, and. Um, and try to make sure uh, things are nice and, and that, that we end all of this war that, that's happening. Um, so I think this idea about where Israel is is an important thing for understanding. Um, where it is geographically is important for understanding many of the books in the, the Old Testament. <coughs> now the New Testament. New Testament, again, different issue. The center of power has shifted now. It's gone to Rome. Rome is here. Rome owns all this stuff. Egypt's a power, owns all this stuff, and then they own stuff over here. And you see where Jerusalem is down here. Um, what, do, what does it look like in comparison to the center of power? It's very much like a colony far, far away. Um, it, it would be like um, if America was this today, it would be like Puerto Rico. Um, something far out there and not at the center of power. Many of the things that controlled their lives, how much they had to pay in taxes, whether roads were built, whether there was a, any other infrastructure, were decisions made hundreds and thousands of miles away from them. Again, a lack of a sense of control, but built within the theology of Jews is this notion from Leviticus that we don't own the land we live on in Israel. Who owns the land? God does. We're caretakers. And God can say all sorts of things about this. But the Romans treated it as their land. And eventually you have this clash between the understanding on the two sides as to what's going on there. And, and it ends up blowing up in the, around the year 70 BC. So um, do you guys follow this and understand mm -hmm. the, the importance of geography? Mm -hmm. And the geography issue is not just important for um, just important for the particular books I mentioned. Just about everything you can, you can talk about and see through those elements. Um, and, and these are, I, I don't know if you, you know what, um, these are uh, leaders in other countries that crushed Israel. This one here is called the Merneptha Stella. It's the first reference to Israel in any place in the world in the year 1209 BC. And a pharaoh um, puts up a Stella, a victory thing. And the funny thing is Israel has no Stellas, S-T-E-L-E, no, none. Everybody else, the Moabites have Stella. Everybody has Stella. The Moabites have a Stella about defeating the, the Israelites. And it's interesting because the Stella talks about the exact same ba battle that the Hebrew Bible talks about. So you can see a battle from two different perspectives. Merneptha Stella says in the year 1209 BC, before the Israelites have moved into Cana, um, it says, Israel is laid waste, its seed is no more. Um, that's down about right here in hieroglyphics. Anyone want to read it for us? <laughs> um, so, um, but that's the first reference. There's no earlier reference to Israel until that time. That's when we know there must be a nation or a group of people that consider themselves to be, um, to, to be uh, a, a nation. 
Um, the top one is an Assyrian king who comes in in the year 702 BC and de defeats the people in northern Israel where the 10 lost tribes are. And then the, latter, the bottom one is <coughs> the Arch of uh, Titus in Rome where uh, Titus comes in and destroys Jerusalem. And that is, as, uh, you might see the menorah in there. That's the first, the first indication that there were menorah um, in the year 70 BC, yeah, there, 70 AD. What's that? The column is, is being restored. <laughs> it is being restored. I'll show you another picture of it in a second. Um, so these are all these are all people defeating Israel. You can find many many of these things. Everybody, it was it was they were the Washington generals of the ancient world. You could go and defeat the, the every other group could come through and wipe them out whenever they wanted to do it. It was rare when Israel was able to win something. <coughs> Which brings me to my third point. Open the Bible is the start of a conversation. <coughs> Context is key to understand the Bible. Three, the Bible is written almost exclusively by oppressed people. Not people like us. These are people who have been defeated repeatedly, have been on the losing end of just about every battle that they know about, and end up being destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. Okay? So... When you read the Bible, even the stuff that's real blustery and things like that, it's usually, you know, in response to the fact that, you know, it's like, um, it's like when I grew up in West Virginia. Things were terrible all around us, and like if the, if the West Virginia University won a football game, we went nuts because it was the only good thing we could think about um, going on on this day. So that's that's what you get. Um, what you get there. Okay, now my fourth point, and this one is, that's the where question. <coughs> now we're gonna talk about the, the, the when question, okay? And I believe for both the Old Testament and for the New Testament, there's one central event that affects how the books are written. I'm not saying the most important uh, event in the Old Testament or New Testament, but most important event affecting how it's written. Does anyone wanna guess what, what, for the Old Testament, what would be your pivotal event, if there is one. I know this is artificial. What was Exodus, the exodus from the, from, um, the exodus from slavery, okay? Um, <coughs> any other? I'm not saying you're right or wrong. And if there is no right or wrong. The the covenant. Covenant. What's that? The covenant. The covenant, okay. Um, which covenant? The Noah's <laughs> covenant, Abraham's covenant, Abraham. David's covenant? <laughs> there are covenants all around. Um, anybody else? Ten Commandments, Moses. Okay. Um, each of these are pivotal events for the nation of Islam. I'm talking about pivotal <coughs> events for the creation of the Old Testament. Okay? It is the Babylonian captivity in the year 586 BC, which is not something we talk about a great deal. But what happens at that time? The temple is destroyed, and it, in 586 BC, the Jewish faith is about the temple. It's about God. It's about God and the temple and the territory. It's the land and there and two of those things get wiped out. One, the temple is destroyed. And two, most of the leaders are shipped out. They're moved from Jerusalem over to where Babylon is. <clears throat> this creates a huge crisis in terms of their understanding of themselves. Who are we? We don't have a temple anymore. It's gone. Who are we? We're not even in the land anymore. Who are we as Jews? What did they have to hold on to? The they temple had, was where God was. The temple is where God was, right. And that's why I'm saying, when I was talking about the emergence of monotheism, God is no longer in a particular place. This is, there's a crisis, and what, what do they have to hold on to at this point when they <coughs> moved to Babylon, all the leaders, the priests, and all that sort of stuff? They have stories. They have understanding of their faith. And this is the time when, when the, the Jews started putting together, the stories already existed, but they start putting them together, organizing them, telling each other stories, and creating an identity for themselves. The word Jew doesn't appear till then. It's, that's right. Um, this, is, this is when, this is when, um, when what we have as an Old Testament exists. It wouldn't have existed had the Babylonian captivity not happened. In the New Testament, what's the pivotal event for the creation of the New Testament? Anybody have any guesses? 70. 70. You, have you been reading my notes? <laughs> <laughs> it's the great Jewish revolt in the year 70. Um, it's, it started in 66, 
and ends in 74. 74 is when Masada is, where a bunch of them ran out there and then they're killed. But in 70 is when um, it is when uh, Jerusalem is destroyed. Some people call this the first Holocaust. More than a million Jews are killed in the in the siege on Jerusalem. Um, perhaps as many as uh, one and a half million Jews. And again, what you have is at this time the <coughs> definition of what a Jew was was three T's: territory, <coughs> temple, a new temple had been built, and that's the center of the face, and uh, Torah. Torah exists at this time because. The Old Testament, because they've created the Old Testament after the first, the first destruction. So we had a second major revolt, and different groups, um, two Jewish groups emerged. Before this, there are dozens and dozens of Jewish groups who believe lots of things, many messiahs. We know of at least eight different people who proclaim themselves to be the messiah before this time. Okay, but at this time, all of that's wiped out, and only two groups emerge. What are the two Jewish groups that emerge? The Christians and the Pharisees. The Pharisees become the rabbis who become modern-day Judaism. Christians um, emerge out of this. And, and how do they respond? What do they have after this? They have each other, and they have stories about who Jesus is. And what's the significance of the Jesus story at this time? All these Jews have been killed at one point, more than 5,000 Jews are being crucified a day during this thing. <clears throat> they run out of wood in Jerusalem because they're crucifying so many people. It's a horrible, horrible thing. The thing is, the lesson of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John written? Mark's written probably around the year 70. Matthew and Luke probably 75, maybe 80. And... Um, and and uh, John is written around the year 90 to 100. Why are they written then? Why aren't they written in the year 30, 40, 50? It's because there's a huge crisis that goes on, and they're trying to pass along the message that out of defeat comes victory. That's what the message of those books are. You have relatives who died on the cross. Our Savior has been there, and he emerged victorious. You can't understand what's going on in the New Testament without understanding this context. There's a writer named James Carroll, who's a former Catholic writer who, who, who's, um, who writes about this, this particular thing in, in, in particular. The Roman war against the Jews prompted radical shifts in the religious imagination of the, of the Jews. Hmm. Mark's rendering of Jesus, and he's making the case about the Gospel of Mark, of Jesus and its proclamation of its meaning of the Christ are the central pillars of the Christian imagination. Yet Mark is rarely read in the context of the war raging around the outside of the cell in which it was composed. Taking seriously the context out of which this text emerged leads inexorably to the thought that Jesus was rendered by Mark as, as obsessed with end times. The early sources on which the author of Mark drew seem to have emphatically interpreted Jesus within the Jewish apocalypse genre, but then all that shifts with this, with this, um, with what happens in the year 70. We don't talk about this very much, but you've got to realize this is a wartime environment in which they're again losing and losing in a serious way. This is also, I've said this about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but I've just started to realize this before. I said, I've said about the Dead Sea Scrolls, the importance is, and the scenes are grouped that's wiped out by this. Scenes are out in the wilderness, they're apocalyptic, they believe Jesus is going to, they believe the Messiah is going to come, maybe two Messiahs are going to come, and what they end up getting is the Romans overrunning them and killing them. And they're gone. And so I've said about the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's one of the few works of history in which we get it written by the losers. But actually, the more and more I think about it, I think the Old and New Testament are written by the historical losers who end up being the religious winners. And that's why we have the text today. But at this point, they survive, but it's not survival in any great way. For those who've been to Jerusalem, um, there are a lot of things there that are still, uh, you can actually see the boulders, these huge boulders that have been knocked over um, as a result of that. They're still in existence. There's a house there where the ceiling collapsed and killed this woman in the year 70. And the, the, her bowls are still in the same stack that, that are there when it happens. It's called the Burnt House. You can find it online. Um, so this was such a traumatic event. It affects the way everybody read and wrote the Old Testament, I mean the New Testament. 
here's what we were talking about the Arch of Titus. This is the victory arch to celebrate defeating Jerusalem. Um, here's the arch. These are two different versions of the same thing with the menorah, and it's up underneath here where it shows the Jews walking, carrying all of their stuff. They required uh, the ones who survived to carry all their belongings to, to Rome. Um, and it, the funny thing is, I don't know if you, you are aware of this, in the year 130, another guy pops up and says, I am, I am the Messiah, and the head of rabbinic Judaism at that point says, yes, you are. And they lead a, a second Jewish revolt, um, which again is unsuccessful. And um, and Israel's, I mean, Jer Jerusalem's eventually wiped out again and given a new name. And this Messiah, a guy named Bar Kokhba, ends up running to the Dead Sea Scrolls area and hiding in a cave. And they just, the Romans just sat underneath the cave and let him die. And you can find letters today that he wrote to other people that stayed in the cave. It was just discovered a few years back. Um, so, my fourth rule, opening the Bible is the start of a conversation, context is key, the Bible is written by an oppressed people, and much of the Bible is crisis literature. It's written in response to or uh, as a result of crisis. You guys get this? Is this, is this new stuff for you or not? Yeah, yeah. yeah it is. So, the oppressed people part um, is an idea I got partially from him and from another writer named Jacob Wright, who's a, a Jewish professor at, Emer at uh, Emory, both very interesting. And he applies this idea of crisis to mostly to the Old Testament. But I think it really works for the New Testament. And, and you know, it's hard to read, it's hard to read Revelation without understanding this context. This is, we're getting back at them for what they did to us. Um, that's that's the sort of instinct that's driving that. Would you say something about Paul as an author, being a primary early author? Was, was he Paul writing was writing before. Was he Paul writing was, out of oppression or Paul was or, writing, or had had he had he uh, been fleeing from oppression? I, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people are doing what are called um, um, uh, studies of the New Testament within the context of the Roman Empire. In fact, it's an easy way to get published is to write a lot of books like that. Um, and um, Paul is writing before that time, but he gets reinterpreted after the event as a result of that. So you end up with some ideas in there that are weird. In Romans 13, one is it 13, one I think, where he says that, that we're to obey all authorities and stuff. Um, but he's also saying, including the temporal authorities, so you end up with that, but you also have um, other things that he say he says that are um, somewhat critical, and you know it helps you understand also why certain stories resonate with the people. Um, remember the story where where there's a person possessed by demons, and um, he then casts out the demon and puts it in a, a bunch of pigs, and they go run off the edge and, and die. Do you remember the name of Legion? Legion. Which what's a legion? Army. It's the Roman army, and the seventh Roman legions what came through and destroyed mm -hmm. Jerusalem. So, when you hear that story, it's not just a story. If in the year seventy you're reading that in Mark and you come across a legion and they end up being destroyed, the message is a metaphorical message. Maybe this story happened. Maybe it didn't. Who cares? The message is that in the end the legion is going to be destroyed. Maybe they won the battle, but we're going to win the war eventually. So They get turned into pigs, right? And juice <laughs> well, it, it's, it's, the pigs are important because it's right. a dirty, right. yeah, yeah. It's, it's a whatever. Go ahead. I thought you were going to say something. Else. OK. So those are my, I'm excited about points three and four because it's something I've just recently started thinking, and it's starting to affect the way I see, um, the way I see things when I'm reading scripture. I don't think it dictates it. But it's the context, point two. Context is key. And this helps you understand where the writers are coming from. Just like if you're in a conversation, it's helpful to know where someone is from, what their religious background is, all this sort of stuff, their social background, and whatever. So these, these two points lead to my next, my fifth and final point. And that is, when you read the Bible, you realize that we're coming from two different worlds. The biblical world and our world are very, very different. Next week we'll talk about similarities, but I want to talk about differences right now. And that is, um, we think about things, a lot of different things in different ways. And I'll just run through some of them. I mean, maybe you could think of them. What are things we think about differently than the biblical writers think about? 
just about anything involving science, yeah. <clears throat> about the way the world rotates, mm -hmm. and the way um, food preparation. Food preparation. I, I listed ten, but you can come up with a hundred. Um, the role of women, um, hierarchy in society. Here are mine. Gender roles, individual rights, which wasn't a notion that existed then. Human relations. Um, the, the whole, those whole genocide scenes where God tells the Israelites to wipe out everybody. That's a little bit difficult to read and swallow. Medicine and disease, childbirth. Um, maybe next week I'll tell you, I'll explain to you how the belief is that the virgin birth works. And it's not like the way we think our births work because they understood childbirth very differently. So remind me if I forget. Mm, genetics, which affects our understanding, I think, of evil because there's some things that are genetic that they would never have thought of or um, that being punished for a sin committed by your parents or whatever, you cast that in a new light because actually you could have had this stuff passed along. Colonization, these people were essentially a colony of other civilizations. We don't have that feeling. We don't know what it's like to live as a, as a colonized force. Sanitation, and it's, it's funny, I was explaining to my daughter recently that in, um, in ancient societies where they do digs and stuff, there's graffiti all over houses and people writing things all over the place. And the most common one, the, the most common uh, bit of script, uh, um, what, what, the reason I was interested in this is uh, in, in Turkey, they recently found the first reference to Christians and a bit of graffiti from around the year 120. Um, but uh, there's a, the most common form of graffiti was uh, please do not urinate on my house, um, which, which wasn't like the, in those languages in particular. <laughs> the nature of truth, I'm going to get back to this in just a second. Nation states, they don't have nation states. <coughs> family relations, where we're nuclear families, they are not. An oral and written culture. Um, most people couldn't read, so all of us can read. So it changes the way we access information. The thing about the nature of truth, I'm just going to take a second on, on this. Um, and that is, um, we like things to be consistent. Well, if you aren't consistent, then newspapers give you um, bad marks, say your pants are on fire, and uh, you flip-flopped on the issue. I've written the word flip-flop a lot, I know this. Um, but um, we're not very comfortable with competing ideas. The Jews had a very different understanding of that. If they have two stories, if an editor of Genesis has two stories about the creation of the world, they didn't merge them into one and eliminate all inconsistency. They put them both there and said the truth is somewhere in here. They're not telling you exactly where it is, but it's somewhere in that those two stories together. Another, another example, the story of King David. In First and Second Samuel, King David is a pretty terrible guy. I've seen people describe him as, as a, an ancient version of Saddam Hussein, killing people, um, you know, uh, uh, killing individuals, killing groups of people, um, doing a number of horrible things. In First and Second Chronicles, he's perfectly good. He commits no sin throughout both books at all. Do the editors of the Bible, do they give you one or the other? No, they give you both. And you get to choose. The story of the resurrection, four stories of the resurrection, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, none of those stories match. But that didn't disturb the people putting together the Bible. It disturbs us more than it disturbs them. In fact, it did disturb one guy named Tatian in the year 150 AD. He put together a thing, merged it all together, removed all inconsistencies, and it was a thing called the Dia Tesseron. And the Orthodox Church still reads from this book. It eliminates all inconsistencies. The church decided we don't want to use that. The ortho, I mean, the, the Catholic and Protestant churches, we don't use it all. You guys have never heard of it until I just told you about it. But it exists, and um, they said, no, not that. We're going to take the four versions that we have out there, and the truth is in there. We're not going to tell you where, but it's in there. It's a different understanding of the nature of truth than what we have. It makes us comfortable when I'm talking to somebody and I say, oh, this movie reminds me of the Jesus of the, the, book, the book of Luke, not so much the one of the book of John. And I'm like, there's one Jesus. Well, that's true, but that's not what we have. We have four stories of who Jesus is. I was going to say, uh, explaining particle physics and quantum mechanics these days is often 
two different stories that can't be one can't reconcile with the other. So people talk about it's, multiple. It's actually theories. a much more postmodern than a modernist mm -hmm. thing is to, to bring everybody together. Postmodern understanding is more like Brian McLaren's uh, book on on the generous orthodoxy, in which he takes. Um, elements of each of the major religions and denominations and find something that he thinks is worthy to keep and then builds together a whole story from those things, a fabric, sort of a patchwork fabric of, of those things and says, this is, this is, even fundamentalist Christians, you can find good things about them. They understand the Bible. I've read many of these verses, had to reread them, memorize them, memorize them in Greek because, because of my background. Most of you haven't had, to, haven't had to do that. And so he puts all those things together which is a more of a postmodern understanding. And you know, it's funny because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John fit that much better. And you know, when I said to read Genesis earlier, the problem is Genesis is a collection of a bunch of stories that have been just put together. So you get two versions of the Noah story and they sort of weave back and forth. They don't exactly match, so it's not really easy reading. Same thing happens with Abraham and Sarah, two stories that the editors put together and been weaving them back and forth. So if you just try to read it, it doesn't make much sense. I actually have a Bible hmm, called Bible with Sources Revealed, in which this guy has broken out the sources by color. So you can see the two different variations of the text that the editor was using to put this together. The belief is that there are at least four, and probably many more, different versions of stories that are put together to create the book of Genesis. When, uh, can, can we say that Luther, Luther's genius was that he brought, he, uh, brought back the concept of uh, paradox? He, he, he did. Um, and there are other people who are comfortable with paradox. Um, and that's actually a central Lutheran tenet. I mean, the paradox is paradox and mystery though I think mystery is sometimes used when you don't have a good idea as to what to think. Um, so these are my five things. I, I know I'm running over just a minute, but these are my five lessons for today. We'll touch on these next week, and then we'll talk about the last two parts about um, receiving and reflecting on the text. And that is, opening the Bible is the start of a conversation. Context is key. The Bible is written by an oppressed people. Much of the Bible is crisis literature, and that we need to discover and embrace the differences between our world and their world. Not to reject them, paint them over, come up with different things. When you encounter a text that's different than what our vision is, if you come across a text like the genocide text that I mentioned, how do you deal with that? You need to be aware that not everything you think is going to match the Bible, and not everything in the Bible is going to match you, and that's okay. Hmm. Yeah, you're the, on the crisis literature, also the New Testament states that Jesus is coming back, and, and will make everything right for the early Christians. Well, th well that's... And that's the early again. Christians were really waiting for that to happen soon. Out of points three and four, you figure out why <coughs> one of the dominant themes in the Old and the New <coughs> Testament is justice. Because when you're on the raw end of the deal, you want to know how things are being corrected. And the idea, which I went to a class on the nature of hell and the understanding, which is becoming a less and less popular topic, but the one thing it addresses is ultimate justice. Hmm. If you don't believe in a hell, where what eventually happens with Hitler? Does he get his just desserts or not? Hmm. Um, it's a difficult question. I mean, I have a hard time believing in, in, in hell myself, but that's that's a really tough issue. And that's you know the na the idea of resurrection. We know when it exactly was created. It's created in the year one around the year 160 BC, and it's in the book of Daniel, the first reference to, to resurrection. And that is, again, a response to, um, to a, an act in, in which a guy named Antiochus Epiphanes IV came in and started killing people for reading Torah, circumcising their kids, and doing all the stuff that they're supposed to be doing. It creates a crisis for people. Hmm. We were doing what we were supposed to be doing, yet we end up dying. And, and the idea of resurrection comes about that in the end, <coughs> everything's going to be made whole because you were doing the right thing. If that doesn't exist, you're left with this idea that w when we do what we're supposed to do, what the Bible tells us we're to do, we end up dying. And that's a hard concept to hold mm. or to stay with your faith. It's similar to, the, it's similar to the, the crisis that occurred after the Holocaust in which 
we did what we were supposed to do, and yet six million of us end up dying. Where was God during that time? And it's a question that still, you know, to me is one that I spend a lot of time thinking about and dealing with. So, so that's part one of the class, part two next week. Uh, we hope to have the videos up if, if you're interested. Um, and I'll touch on some of this and then move on. And I will start next week with some of your thoughts on my five points. You don't have to agree with them, but um, they're my five right now. So, okay, thank you very much. Yeah.